Working with date and time data can be really challenging. With all the different date and time formats, ISO standards, different time zones, daylight saving, adjusting for time traveling with tachyon particles, it goes on and on. Today, I want to take you through how Python's built-in daytime package works. Talk about some of the alternatives that are out there to help you make dealing with dates and times easier and whether those alternatives are actually necessary. Learning about these things help you become a better software engineer and hone your critical thinking skills. If you want to take this a step further, I have a free workshop for you that teaches you how to diagnose existing code and quickly see what the main problems are. It's one of the most important things to get good at, especially as you start moving into a more senior position. You can get access to the workshop by going to ion.codes slash diagnosis. The workshop is organized around three factors and contains loads of code examples, also from well-known Python packages. Just grab it for free at ion.code slash diagnosis. The link is also in the description. Why is dealing with dates and time such a pain? It's a dichotomy between, on the one hand, computer software, which tends to be ordered and structured and generic, and on the other hand, the quite unstructured way we deal with dates and times. Things are never the same. Some years don't have the same number of days because they're leap year. Months don't have the same number of days. Each day doesn't have the same number of hours if you consider daylight time saving. Not all countries have daylight time saving, and those that do may apply daylight time saving at a different moment in time. Then we have time zones, which are not divided by longitudinal geodesics due to political and historical reasons. In short, it's a big mess. In our little computer bubble, we do have some kind of standard way of representing dates and time. Most computer systems count time starting from an arbitrary point in time called the Unix Epoch. January 1st, 1970 at 000 hours UTC. What's UTC? I'll talk more about that in a minute. So Unix time is measured in seconds since January 1st, 1970. You can easily get the Unix time tab in Python with just a few lines of code. So I've imported the time package here and you can simply print time dot time. And this is going to give you the Unix timestamp, which looks like this. So these are the seconds that have passed and this is the fraction of the second that has passed so far. So it's a floating point value. Now, because this is a floating point, Python can't guarantee anything about the precision. If you want a more precise representation, you can also get time underscore NS, which stands for nanoseconds. And if we print that, then we're going to get an actual integer number that represents the number of nanoseconds passed since January 1st, 1970. An interesting thing about Unix time is that since most older operating systems are 32-bit, they store the Unix time in a 32-bit signed integer. You probably already know where this is going if you're aware of the year 2K problem, but there's also a year 2038 problem, which is when the signed 32-bit integer runs out of values in these older operating systems. Specifically at 3.14 a.m. and seven seconds on January 19th, 2038, the 32-bit integer is going to overflow, resulting in the year 2038 problem. Now Python itself won't have a direct issue with it because integers don't have a fixed number of bits in Python, it's dynamic. But Python of course under the hood uses OS functions to get the current time, so there's still going to be a problem due to that. In short, if you want to avoid catastrophic consequences to your critical systems in 2038, Make sure that in the next 15 years or so, you switch to a 64-bit operating system or more. If you're planning to still run a critical system on 32-bit OS in 2038, can you just please fire yourself? The world thanks you. Like I mentioned before, Unix time is expressed in the UTC time zone. UTC stands for Universal Time Coordinated or Coordinated Universal Time. Before 1972, this time was called Greenwich Mean Time. GMT, sometimes erroneously called Greenwich Meridian Time. And it's pronounced Greenwich, not Greenwich, unless you live in the land of Oz. UTC is a coordinated time scale maintained by the Bureau International des Poids et Mesures, BIPM. It's not adjusted for daylight saving time, so there's always 24 hours in a day. It's also known as Z time or Zulu time, which sounds way cooler than UTC, right? Let's take a look at how we deal with dates and times in Python. I've imported the datetime class from the datetime package. I think, by the way, it was a bad decision to 
use date time lowercase as the class name here because it mixes up the package name and the class name, which is really annoying. Because if you do import date time, then you have to write date time dot date time everywhere. You can use an alias, but I think it's better to just let the class name start with an uppercase letter so that you can easily distinguish between the package name and the class name. Anyway, date time class. It's very easy to use. You can create a variable, let's call that some date, and that's going to be date time, and then we can basically specify the date in terms of, uh, let's say, the year, and we're going to put some kind of random date, and let's say it's going to be 6 a.m. And now we've created a date, and I can print this date as well. And if we run this, then this is what we're going to get. Since Python 3.6, Daytime also supports ISO 8601 parsing, which is a standard way of representing dates and times as a string. Instead of calling the initializer here, I can call the from ISO format method that's going to return a daytime object, and I can pass it an ISO string, like for example, 2022.09.16, and the time is going to be, I don't know, 14.05, and let's say uh, 13 milliseconds. Doesn't really matter. And when I run this, we still get a regular date object just as usual. But now we've read it from an ISO string. Getting the current date is also really easy because daytime has a now method. And when we run this, we're going to get the current date. So as you can see, I'm recording this video on September 16. Comparing dates is also really easy. We can simply use the comparison operators. And since it's 1.30 now, when I run this code, this is going to print false. Date and time objects can be broadly divided into two categories, aware and naive. If an object contains time zone information, it's time zone aware, else it's called time zone naive. In Python, objects like datetime have an optional property, tzinfo, that contains the time zone information. By default, datetime is time zone naive, so this object isn't set to anything. If you want time zone aware date times, you need a module that can deal with all the issues related to time zones that I mentioned earlier. In Python, we have the PYTZ package for this. It's not built into Python, you have to add it as a dependency. You might wonder where all this time zone and daylight saving settings come from. Well, basically most software in the world retrieves that information from a centralized time zone database, which is currently maintained by one guy in California. Well, kinda. It's a fascinating story. I don't have time to dive into it in this video, but there's a link in the description to an article in Medium if you want to read more about it. Let's look at a few time zone examples. So in order to work with time zone, I'm going to use the PYTZ package. You need to install this explicitly. It's not bundled with Python. So from PYTZ, I'm going to import time zone. That's going to help us deal with time zones. So if we start with the sum date variable, let me just delete this code. You can now add time zone support to it. So default, as I've mentioned, date time is time zone naive. It doesn't know anything about time zones. We have to explicitly deal with it. So what we can do is create the time zone function here to create a time zone info object. So let's start simple by having a UTC time zone like so. And now we can localize the date to that time zone. So the time zone info object has a localized method that gets a date time object. So that's some date. And then we can print the localized time. And let me also print some date before that. Like so. And let me run this code. And then this is what you're going to see. So now actually when you print the date, there is time zone information included in it because it's no longer time zone naive. Now that it has time zone information, we can convert between different time zones. So for example, I can create a Sydney time zone, like so. And then I can print this localized date, this time zone aware date, as time zone Sydney. So when I convert this UTC time into the time in Sydney, we're going to get five minutes past midnight. Similarly, I can create another time zone. Let's say we have Amsterdam. And when we run that, it means that in Amsterdam, it's two hours later than the UTC time. The built-in daytime package in Python is nice, but it has some limitations. First, 
There are lots of different modules and types. Date, time, daytime, calendar, date util, TZ info, time delta, and more. It gets confusing pretty quickly if you need to do more advanced things with dates and times. Time zone conversion with daytime is not bad, but you need to create a TZ info object explicitly to convert a daytime into another time zone. And by default, daytime is time zone naive. It doesn't take time zones into account unless you explicitly indicate that it should. Now, over the past few years, a lot of things have been improved in the daytime package, like adding support for parsing ISO 8601 strings, but then there are still some functionalities missing, such as humanizing dates and durations. People have developed alternative packages that deal with dates and times, such as Arrow, DeLorean, and Pendulum. These packages generally offer a nicer interface than the standard daytime package. I won't go into detail for each of these packages since they all mostly try to solve the same limitations, but I am going to take a closer look at Pendulum today. Pendulum provides a drop-in replacement for the daytime class, but adds simpler time zone handling. Daytimes are time zone aware by default, and it has a bunch of extra features such as localization or being able to easily write a human readable version of a time span. Let's take a look at how Pendulum works, but before I do that, I'd really appreciate if you would take the time to hit the like button if you're enjoying this video so far. It's going to help YouTube recommend my content to others. I want to show you the basics of how you use Pendulum. So the first step is that we're going to import the Pendulum package. And of course you need to install the package. The main difference between Pendulum and Daytime is that Pendulum is by default time zone aware. So instead of creating a Daytime like this, what I can do now is Pendulum dot daytime and then we're going to pass it a date similar to what we did to daytime so just something like this so we have the date and the time and then i can also indicate the time zone so i'm now indicating utc but this is actually the default time zone if you create a pendulum daytime so there we go so the daytime package is no longer needed the pendulum gives us a subclass of daytime but if i run this then we're going to get this time and there is also the time zone information in there now time zone conversions are also really simple for example you can simply write some date dot in time zone and then we supply the time zone and then this is going to be the equivalent time in australia sydney pendulum also handles time transitions properly. So if you are just on the edge of reaching summertime or winter time, Pendulum is going to take care of this. So here I've put in a date. I think this is actually from the Pendulum documentation in the Europe or Paris time zone. So I print the date and then I add a microsecond and then I subtract it again. So when I run this, you see that it's actually exactly on a switch between daylight saving times because from 1.59.59 I add one microsecond and I'm going to uh, 3 a.m and back to 159.59. So Pendulum takes care of these kinds of transitions for you automatically. Another nice thing is that Pendulum provides localization. So I can write pendulum.setLocal and then I'm going to set NL, which is the Dutch locale. And then I can print, let's say, date format, and now I can print a formatted date. So what I want to do is the day of the week and the day and the month and the years. And then when I print it like this, then we're going to get a Dutch localized version of the date because I set the locale to Dutch. And I can change the locale to something else. Let's say I want to print it in Italian and then we're going to get the date printed in Italian, which is really simple and really useful. Now you can override the locale. So default locale is now Italian, but if I want to override it to, let's say German, then we can simply pass it as an argument to the format method, and then we're going to get a German date. There are also standard localized format. So instead of having to write this long string here, actually this should have been four Y's and not five. You can also write something shorter. For example, this is going to print only the time. And that looks like this in German. But if I change to, let's say, EN, then it's going to look slightly differently because that uses the AM, PM style. There's a couple of different options here. This is an, another example of a localized format and that looks like this. So that prints the day of the week and the actual date and the time 
as well. And then of course, if I change the locale, it's also going to print it in the correct locale. You also see that it's different because in English we write the day after the month and in Dutch we write it in front of the month. Another thing you can do is print a time span and also print it in a humanized way so that we puny humans also understand it. So let's say um, I can print pendulum dot now and then I'm going to add one year and I'm going to print diff for humans and then this is what we're going to get. We get an error because it shouldn't be year, it should be years. Let's try that again and then there we go and it's still in Italian. Maybe I should put it back to uh, some other locale because I don't understand any Italian. So here it is in Dutch in one year. That's what it means. And also here you can override the locale again. So I can change this back to let's say English and then we're going to get an English version of this time span. So currently the time span is printed as a relative string. Something is going to happen in one year. You can also simply have an absolute time span like three days or one year. If you want that you simply pass the absolute argument and you set it to true. And then this is what we're going to get. One year absolute value. There are also a couple of helpful properties. Uh, for example, there is, let me print pendulum dot now. Then we have, for example, the day of the year. So if you print the day of the year, we're going to have 259. So it's the 259th day of the year when I'm recording this. Uh, there's a couple of others like uh, day of week. So I'm recording this on a Friday. So that's the fifth day of the week. There's also week of month and week of year. For example, here, week of year, which is, I think, week 37. Yeah, so it's week 37. And a few others, like you can get the uh, int timestamp, for example, like, like so, just using a simple property. And there's also a float version of this, which prints the float and then also adds the precision, like we've seen in the basic daytime example I showed earlier. Next to that, there's also a bunch of other helpful methods. For example, if you want to know the start of today, you can get that very easily. I just write pendulum.now.start of day. And now we're going to get the time representing the start of the day in the current time zone, which is, I'm at UTC plus two. Normally it's plus one, but it's daylight saving, so it's plus two. And you also have end of day, which gives us the time at the end of the day. And that looks like this. Another thing that's not possible in the built-in daytime module, but that is possible with Pendulum, is that durations also support years and months. So if you write something like this, um, pendulum.duration, and then I can specify a number of years and months, like so. And then I can simply print duration.days, and I'm going to get the total number of days that the duration represent, which is 1185 in this example. So you see lots of things are possible, especially like the localization option that Pendulum provides. Localization, by the way, is a topic all in itself. I really like to do a more in-depth video about it. Now, I did do a dashboard application tutorial a couple of weeks ago. I put a link to that video series to the top. You can watch the first part. And there I also touch on localization a little bit. So should everyone switch to a package like Pendulum? Well, it's nice. It adds very useful extra features, but here are a couple of things to think about. First, Pendulum hasn't seen a new release for a while. Last version on GitHub was published over two years ago. This is always a risk with using external package and production code. You have to consider whether they're being actively maintained and for how long. Second, the built-in daytime package is being worked on as well. There are only minor changes in that package in Python 3.11, like a slightly more robust from ISO format method. But as more functionality is added, you might not need that external package anymore. And then you potentially have to do a lot of refactoring work to move away from the package you used before. Though Pendulum does inherit directly from the daytime class, which reduces that risk somewhat. And finally, do you really need the extra features? If you don't, simply stick with the built-in daytime package. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. I hope this video gave you some food for thought about dealing with dates and times in your own code. Next to daytime, Python has lots of other interesting packages. For example, pathlib. If you want to learn more about dealing with paths, check out 
this video. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you next week.